Love this podcast? Support it and sponsor today. Simply head to oscastnetwork.com for details. Oh, a book is like a genie in a bottle. Hello and welcome to Sundoku, a safe place for book addicts. I'm Michaela Andreev. And I'm Kath Keneally. Great to be here. I'm looking forward very much to chatting later in the program about two classics by a writer you might not have heard of called Evan S. for Shelby Connell. No, I haven't. He was born in 1924. He lived in Kansas City. He's described as a writer's writer Mm -hmm. uh, and he was nominated at the end of his life for a Man Booker Special Prize for a Lifetime Achievement. But I don't think he ever hit the big time especially. He wrote a lot of historical novels but the ones that I'm interested in are diptych, I suppose, Mrs Bridge and Mr Bridge and they're about a couple who are living in Kansas City in the 30s, although as you read the book, which is about their losing their grip on the evolving modern world and the, particularly the malaise of the wife, they completely lose their grip on where their kids are going. And you read it and you think, this is the 1950s, this is Leave It to Beaver, this is... <laughs> this know, is today. <laughs> this is today. And they're just terrific books. Kath, that sounds fantastic, although I don't know if I should be reading that as a mother of 20-year-olds. They're just on the verge of leaving the house and, uh, yeah, it's a bit of an adjustment. <laughs> <laughs> it's funny too, I'll, I'll give it that. But Good. I gather, Michaela, that you have been in Sydney and bearding a very famous writer in his den. I have. I have Michael Robotham. He's a crime thriller writer. He's sold millions of copies of books all over the world. And I was lucky enough to get his first interview for his latest book, Lying Beside You. It's the third book in the Cyrus Haven series. I have to say he was so welcoming. He invited me into the living room in in the front of his house. The room was full of beautiful pictures of family, lovely comfy couches. He made me feel so welcome and I thought... Really, as a man who has written this many scary crime thrillers, surely he's got to have a head full of dark thoughts. So I actually started by saying to him, probably a little bit cheekily, does he have a dark side? No, I think I know a lot of crime writers around the world. Uh, I've been very lucky to become friends with a lot of people like Val McDermott and Ian Rankin and and Michael Connolly and and Stephen King is another example. And, And while we write about dark subjects we're actually uh, completely the opposite my theory is that we put all our dark thoughts on the page and it means that in real life we are actually um quite relaxed about things and people often imagine because i do write about dark subjects and crimes um and corruption that i imagine the world to be a really dark and dangerous place um but i think the former journalist in me knows exactly what the figures are and that we we have fewer murders per capita than we have at any time in our history. We have um, fewer violent crimes uh, than at any time. The only thing that's probably less safe is riding a push bike on a road because of more traffic. So the crime figures are actually trending down, but I think the way the 24-hour news cycle works is we perceive the world as being more dangerous than at any time in history, but yet that's not the truth. It's, it's far harder, I think, to be pessimistic than optimistic. And I'd rather be optimistic. You obviously don't mind poking a little bit of fun at yourself, though you write in a space called the Cabana of Cruelty. <laughs> yeah, that, that was my daughter's doing. My, uh, they, in our previous house, I had a basement office, which they referred to as Dad's Pit of Despair. You know, and, uh, and, and that was partly due to the fact that you know, obviously writing, I mean, I get a little upset when I hear people say, writers saying that writing is hard. Mm. Okay, there are, t- there are tough days, but, you know, raising a disabled child is hard. You know, um, surviving on the minimum wage or on unemployment benefits is hard. You know, working as a nurse is hard. I mean, the idea that, you know, it's a privilege to be able to write full time. What are the elements you need for a good day of writing? Oh, that's a really good question. The elements, I mean, I'm enormously fortunate to be able to do this full time. Um, 
you know, I, I joke about, you know, a number of years ago I was invited to a writer's festival and the, and the subject to, under discussion was how hard it is to be a full-time writer. And I actually opened up by saying it's so hard, you know, I have to wake up every morning without an alarm clock and I have to decide if I'm going to have breakfast on the south end of the beach or the north end of the beach <laughs> and will I have the panini or the poached eggs on sourdough. And, you know, it's it's such a joy to be able to do this full time. So really I just need, I need the time and the space. That's all I really need, that and my imagination. Readers are hungry beasts and, and publishers are quite demanding um, animals. And you're a successful writer, so there's that pressure on you to keep delivering. Do you work to a, a, an annual cycle? Is it you know, January, you, you start the book, March, it's got to be first draft, July, I'm on tour, August, I have a month off. Mm. Do, you, do you have a, a, a sort of an annual cycle that you yeah, work Yeah, to around? a degree, although that's about to change a little bit because I'm, I'm delaying everything by six months to give my international translators time to catch up what's tending to happen is that so many people around the world uh, english has become their a very strong second language that if they have to wait too long for for german or dutch or italian they will read it in english instead which is unfair on the international translators to so i'm giving them a window to catch up Lovely, um, and, and you get to have a little bit of a break. Do you ever take breaks? Yeah. No, it's funny. I, 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 I finish every book completely convinced that I will never write again. <laughs> sure. <laughs> that I have run out of every decent idea, every clever line, every nice piece of description. It's all gone. I'm an empty vessel. and Because I don't have a drawer full of ideas uh, that I just reach into when one book is finished. And... And I will literally press send on a book and follow my wife around the house until she gets fed up with me and sends me to the cabana to clean up, <laughs> you know. And and two hours later she'll find me and, and typing away and she'll go, "What what are you doing?" And I said, "I've just come up with an idea." So you don't ever work on two books at once? You're... No, I couldn't work on two books at once. Mm. But to me, writing is like breathing. Um, probably I can get away with a day, but two days and. And people around me can see that I'm getting really tetchy and really... And, cause the, and, the, and the great problem, the reason that is, is because I don't plot my books in advance because everything just unfolds on the page each day. Uh, if I go more than a day, I begin having great doubts about the book. If I can go back into it and just spend, you know, 20 minutes reading it, I'll relax and go, OK, it's not, a, it's not the train wreck I, I just imagined it to be. Maybe I can salvage this, you know, maybe I can, I can polish that turd and it will shine. <laughs> <laughs> so let's get on to your latest book. It's the third book in the Cyrus Haven series. Number one was Good Girl, Bad Girl, which won the UK's Crime Writers Association Gold Dagger Award. Number two was When She Was Good, which won the Crime Writers Association Ian Fleming Still Dagger Award. So there was no pressure on this one, was there? Yeah, well, <laughs> yeah, it's weird, isn't it, to, to have won two big awards for the first two books in a, in it's a wonderful. series. And particularly when you, when you, you know, there was a lot of wailing and, 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 and gnashing of teeth from loyal readers when I ended the Joe Lachlan series and, and because people just weren't willing to let that character go. And it's lovely because they've embraced Cyrus Hayden. Isn't that good, um, yeah. But, um, but initially it was, no, 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 we want Joe, bring Joe back. Uh, readers have expectations of you, don't they? So nine yeah. books in the Joe O'Loughlin series and then you say, that's it, you cut them off. <laughs> no, they do have expectations. They're quite funny. It's, it's like I get great feedback from them. I mean, there are some that actually treat the characters as though they're real mm. and they imagine that I live next to Joe O'Loughlin They'll ask me about his children, you know, how's Charlie doing at university, you know. I mean, Peter, Ian Rankin gets the same questions about Rebus, you know. I've had sort of, you know, marriage proposals sent to Joe. It's very flattering when people say that they couldn't put a book down and they read it in one sitting, and which is flattering, but a little part of me wants to say it took me a year to write that sucker <laughs> and you've just scoffed it like a Big Mac and fries, it's, you know. It's the Shows same when <laughs> you cook a big meal for the family and you just think, everyone, now slow down, chew slowly. You know, enjoy well, no, what I've just I cooked. Chew your chapters slowly, <laughs> you know, yeah, and you just scoff it down. And, and then they say, when's the next one? Why is it taking so long? And I mean, give me a break. Yeah. 
So can you tell me in your own words what Lying Beside You, the third book in the Cyrus Haven series, is about? Okay, now all the books I write so they can be read as standalones. Um, I suppose initially I'll introduce the two main characters. Cyrus Haven is a forensic psychologist who does work with the police as a profiler and also treating police officers suffering from trauma Mm. or anxiety or stress and victims as well. He's got a tragic backstory. At the age of 13, he came home from football practice to discover that his parents and his twin sisters had all been murdered by his older brother, who was a schizophrenic. That happened basically when Cyrus was 13. He's now 33. And in the opening of the book, his brother, who has been in Rampton Secure Hospital for 20 years, is applying to be released. And so I guess that's one great element of the story, Even though he's a psychologist and understands that this is mental illness and therefore he should forgive his brother, that his brother wasn't of sound mind, that he's a schizophrenic, another part of him has had his entire childhood stolen from him and yet he's expected to welcome his brother home and to look after him and yet he's struggling to know whether he can forgive this man. And so that's one really important Um, element of the story and the other is an investigation that the disappearance of of, uh, a young woman and the the murder of her father that Cyrus is called upon to investigate and into that mix we have Evie Cormack who is the the very troubled teenage girl that was the star really of good girl bad girl and when she was good and she's now living with um, Cyrus sharing his house as his lodger yeah. And, uh, and <laughs> he's at pains to point out to everyone. <laughs> yes, you know uh, that. Uh, and um, Evie has that unique ability to tell when someone's lying, which is not a gift; it's a complete curse. And yet, it makes her probably the most fascinating character I've ever created. Is that a thing? Is she psychic, or is is it is it a real thing when people can tell if you're lying? No, it's a real thing. It's uh, the world's foremost expert on lying is. Uh, Professor Paul Ekman, and he coined the term truth wizards and he has spent his life researching what's called micro-expressions, those almost subliminal expressions that people have that give them away. Paul Ekman, he estimated that about one in 500 people have an 80% ability to tell when someone's lying. Normally, we've got a 50-50 shot. Yeah, you know? I don't think I've ever got a yeah. clue. <laughs> um, but if you, but normally the people that are better at that tend to be in law enforcement, or customs and immigration, or child services, or the parole service, or the courts, mm. and they're lied to all the time, you know, and they develop a better antenna or system of telling when someone lies. It's interesting when they began testing children for this ability in teenagers, they discovered that children in institutions that had suffered severe abuse had a better ability to tell when someone was lying. And the belief was, although it's still in the early days of research, is that if you've grown up, as Evie Cormack has, Mm. in horrendously difficult and abusive circumstances, particularly in in in, in a household where potentially one moment you're being hugged and the next you're being hit, you develop this incredible sense of... To protect of self-preservation, mm. which is why Evie Cormack has this ability to tell when someone is lying. It all fits. The, the book alternates between Cyrus's voice and Evie's voice. What's your approach to I writing in those two different voices in one book? I write a lot from a female perspective, which to me is the great challenge. Uh, one of the great challenges of being, you know, I'm a white, middle-aged, you know, bald, greying man... But I've been surrounded by women my entire life. You know, there's only myself and the dog in the household <laughs> um, who are male, and both of us have been spayed. And so, you know, so I've been, you know, I mean, a lot of Evie's best lines come from my children. And I did that with even Joe in the Joe Lachlan books with his, his daughter, Charlie. I always remember one, it was one, I can't remember which of my daughters it was when I'd heard that, you know, one of their friends was pregnant. You know, and this is when they were still at high school and asking the question whether they had or hadn't had sex. <laughs> and it was just and it, this perfect response saying, Dad, you know, I could lie to you and disappoint you or I could tell you the truth and disappoint you 
so I'm just not going to say anything at all. <laughs> and I remember walking away thinking, what was that? Gold. <laughs> <laughs> That's why she's pleading the fifth and suddenly I have no idea. Yeah. But <laughs> Yeah. So you've obviously got a real interest in psychology and psychologists. Joe O'Loughlin is a psychologist. Um, Cyrus Haven is. Where's the fascination? And, and um... uh, The fascination with psychology comes from my ghostwriting career. As a ghostwriter, mm-hmm. one of the people I was very fortunate enough to work with was a man called Paul Britton. And he was the pioneer of offender profiling in the UK. And he was a, he was a clinical psychologist that had spent pretty much all his career working in uh, secure hospitals and working with very troubled um, people, deciding if they could or couldn't be treated or if they had to be institutionalised their entire lives. Mm. And he worked on celebrated cases like the Fred and Rosemary West House of Horrors case, the Jamie Bulger, the little boy that was murdered in Liverpool. Um, I mean, he'd worked on over 100 investigations uh, for the police and... I did two books with Paul. Uh, One was called The Jigsaw Man about his police work and the other was picking up the pieces about his clinical work. And I think, you know, he he had without a doubt the most amazing mind of anyone I'd ever met. He could look at you, the way you're groomed, what you're wearing, the way you're sitting, Mm. where you've chosen to sit. He would know far more about you in about 60 seconds than you ever wanted another human being to know. He had the most yes. astonishing ability to read someone. In um, Lying Beside You, the three main characters are all struggling with mental health issues of varying types. Elias, has the, the brother, has schizophrenia. Um, obviously that is great for a crime book, but, but it also it adds pathos to a book, I think, in a way that particularly you look at Elias, you just never know whether, you know, he's a trustworthy figure or not. But there's there's a lot of hmm. sympathy for him as well. I hope so because I do worry. It is in some circles considered to be a bit, a bit of a trope having a, you know, the sort of paranoid schizophrenic, you know, you know bogeyman in, in, in your book. And and I know why we'll get some some letters and communication from people with schizophrenia saying yet again you've portrayed us as being all you know and it's not what I mean to do in this and it's uh you know because he is a complicated character Elias and I think I have tried to make him a sympathetic character Mm. and it's funny I got a a lovely uh, message from Linwood Barclay who was a Canadian crime writer who um, is very good and is an old friend of mine and Linwood's brother is a schizophrenic and throughout Linwood sort of had to look after him for 30 odd years um, and Linwood had read an early copy of Lying Beside You and he said it's astonishing how well you've captured that, um, his schizophrenia, that sort mm. of slight sense of entitlement, you know, that, that sort of naivety, you know, uh, about how the world works and all that. He said, um, but yeah, he said you've actually nailed it which I thought was really That's wonderful. lovely. Mm. Yeah, that's it's great to hear. And I know for, say, romance, the romance genre, you, the rule is you have to like the characters, you have to care about them, otherwise it's not a very good romance. Do you have to care about the characters in a crime novel? You don't have to. I, I think there are writers, much better writers than me, who have created amazing books and I... You know, the classic example is Patricia Highsmith and the Ripley books and also um, Gillian Flynn and Gone Girl where mm. you don't like any of the characters, you know, but they're still completely and utterly compelling. And I think you've got to be a very good writer to pull that off though. You know, if I had three words, my three-word mantra would be make them care. Mm. And to me the absolute death of any artistic project and, and it's... We've all been there where we've been watching something on TV and we suddenly realise we don't care about a single character. That's when we want to just turn it off and mm. walk away. I did care about those characters, but they're, but they're complex and, and imperfect. Yeah, they are. And there's sort of, you know, it's like normally if you said to a crime writer, you're going to have a main character who can tell when someone's lying. You're, it's a recipe for writing the shortest crime novel in history. Because <laughs> yeah. Evie, you know, potentially, you know, if she was pro you'd put her in a room and she'd just simply ask everyone, did you do it, did you do it, did you do it? And she'd know the answer in a heartbeat. 
but um, it doesn't sort of work that way. That and, that, and the way, obviously, I've countered that a little is by making Evie a compulsive liar that no one believes. Yeah. And that, um, and so her heart is huge, but she can't help herself. She's <laughs> just, you know, she's so damaged that she just loves lying. Yeah. And you do speak of them with a real smile on your face. You care about them. You said earlier that you don't map things out from the beginning because I read the books thinking, you know, what's going to happen. But I also read the books thinking, how did you do this? Like it, it's so tight. It's, I thought you must start at the end and work back. No, I, I, um, I must admit, but I, <laughs> the reason I have no hair is because... <laughs> you give me <laughs> because, I lose a lot of it trying to think, how on earth am I going to get all of these people in the one place at the one time and make it believable? I guess, you know, it's, it's like that E.L. Doctorow was the one that said you can write a novel, it's like sort of travelling at night, you can only see as far as the headlights in front of you, but you can still make the journey. And my one rule in this is that as long as when I finish a, a scene or a chapter, I, c- I can see five or six different things I could do next, I'm comfortable Mm-hmm. when I get to the point where I can only see one way for the story to go, then I get very nervous because if that's off a cliff, then I'm I'm having to throw away tens of thousands of words. You yeah. know? And hopefully by about two-thirds of the way through or <laughs> at some point, 70, 80,000 words, I'll think of an ending somewhere and think, okay, now that's what I shoot for. And I often don't get there. I come up with a different ending again. But, yeah. you know. Yeah, oh, it's a loud bird. That is a loud bird. <laughs> but it's an interesting way of writing in the sense, uh, Michaela, that you've got a situation where I've reached the penultimate chapter of some of my novels and I've had five possible suspects and I don't know which one it's going to be. Stop it, you do not. Yeah. I did that with a book called Say You're Sorry. But it, the beauty of it is that every one of them was equally credible as being a possible because I think too often, if you know right from the very beginning, you either try too hard to hide the details or you make it too obvious in the way you've structured it. Yeah. Whereas um, by not settling on who the villain's going to be, like the book I'm writing at the moment, the next book, I don't know who the villain's going to be, but there's four possibles and, and, you know, and I'm sort of, it'll be one of them. <laughs> and is that in the Cyrus Haven series? No, it's a, it's a new, it's a... I did a standalone, mm-hmm. which is silly. It's not called, it won't be a standalone after I write this one with a um, with Philomena McCarthy, a young policewoman who defied the odds to join the London Metropolitan Police because she came from a family of gangsters, and that was uh, when you were mine. Mm. And and the TV rights have just been bought in the UK, and so I thought, yeah, let's do one more Philomena book, and then yeah. I'll go back to to uh, Cyrus and Evie. So that was crime writer Michael Robotham discussing his latest Cyrus Haven book, Lying Beside You, and as it turns out, not a scary guy at all. And I gather, Michaela, that the Joe O'Loughlin books are being made into a TV series. Yeah, we were chatting a little bit after the interview and he said to me that he's just had a sneak preview of the first episode of the Joe O'Loughlin TV series and he loved it. So he did mention that that's going to air September 22, September this year, and it'll be starring Aidan Turner from Poldark. Ooh. It's now time to check out our latest classic. Kath, what have you got for us? It's Evan S. Connell's two books, Mrs. Bridge and Mr. Bridge. And a fellow fan, Olga Sankey, and I got down to the nitty gritty. Here's Olga introducing us to Mrs. India Bridge. Mrs. Bridge is just made for this age, bite sized chunks. They're like little vignettes. It's so beautifully written. They're like little observations that you could read just one and think, that is really satisfying. And they all have a slightly ironic title. He's having fun with this, mm. but he's also got his finger on the pulse of some... It, it, it seems to prefigure early feminism to me. It's, it's 1959, and it's really all about the malaise of the modern, well-to-do, middle-class woman totally dependent on her husband with nothing to do. And I thought, as I read it, that it was the 50s. It was the 30s. I was surprised too, because I thought it was post-war. And I thought, oh, it's that era where they had the... Well, they don't talk about details of washing machines and vacuum cleaning, but I thought it was that era where there was nothing to do. 
But it's you're right. It is earlier, and they've got servants. Mrs. Bridge came out first. Obviously, it was important to Evan Connell to get this portrait of a woman of his era to explain the kind of emptiness of that life. He must have been aware of it as a young man. It's so believable how he got into the female brain. Mm. And it's so perceptive. You empathise with her. You don't fall in love with her because she's very irritating in lots of ways. <laughs> um, in her indecision and kind of she... She lets herself be bossed around, but then again, that would have been the era, possibly. Mm -hmm. She's like Catherine Hepburn. <laughs> <laughs> and ten years later, Mr Bridge comes out, and you've already formed a bit of an opinion of him mm -hmm. from reading Mrs Bridge. And he, in Mrs Bridge, he comes across as the very absent husband who loves her but doesn't take much notice of her and finds her opinions of very little account. And then when you read Mr Bridge... Well, that's validated, and yet you get more of his life. It's interesting, Kat. I think we differ a little bit on how we see him. I agree that certainly he is bossy and he's... It's chicken and egg, because she, she's incapable of making any decisions. So you wonder, has that given rise to his complete control, or has he created her in that way? I liked him more in the book... I think the most surprising thing is that Evan Connell has got the great opening sentences for both. Her parents called her India. It was too interesting a name almost for her. At the end of the book, you kind of have a fairly blighted view of Mr Bridge. And it, it's actually a shock reading the, the opening sentence of Mr Bridge, which says something like, he loved her so much, I can't remember the exact words. You think, what? Like, I didn't see that coming at all. Both books are about how they relate to their children. Their children are way beyond their ken. You actually get a lot more of India Bridge with her children through the lens of the Mr Bridge book. You get rather more episodes where she's succeeding as a mother. But in Mrs Bridge, the reason that she loses her grip on life so completely is because she realises that she doesn't understand where the children are going, what drives them, what their motivations are, what their psychology is. It occurred to me to wonder whether the books were called Bridge because those two people span a couple of centuries where things hadn't changed very much and then a period of great change. I felt incredibly sorry for her because I think it boils down to no confidence because whenever there's any decision to be made, she can't decide anything. What she doesn't have is their respect. I actually thought he gets his kids completely. He knows them. For me, it's the tragedy. She's the kinder and would love them more if she could, but she does everything wrong. I mean, they love her in a kind of abstract way, but nobody respects her. And that's, that's the tragedy of the book. It kind of ends up being quite pathetic. She's a try-hard, whereas at least Mr Bridge kind of... It's sort of the arrogance. You know, it is the gender thing. He's, well, he's a lawyer and he's obviously good at it, but he actually has got a very, very good eye for what things as they are. He knows the middle daughter, Corky, is avaricious and actually not a very nice person and cunning. But smart. But smart. She's the smartest. I think we've got different views on his relationship with his eldest daughter, Ruth. Is, has he got some kind of weird attraction? And she's obviously an extremely attractive um, young woman and kind of mysterious as well. But it's that. But then I sort of thought, but actually, I think it does say he recognises himself in all three. He's got this dark sort of sexual aspect to him that, in a way, Mrs Bridge is too nice to unlock. I'm, I'm not sure whether the thing with Ruth is sexual. It's sort of a kinship. And he gets it that she's up to no good in New York. He knows, mm. whereas Mrs Bridge would not tolerate it. Rereading Mr Bridge was such an ordeal because although he has his flashes of generosity and humanity and there's never any humility, he's, mm. he knows himself well enough, 
but he is totally convinced that his opinions are all correct and he has a coterie of like-minded, very small-minded business friends who are all depicted as loathsome, <laughs> the country club set. He's the least loathsome. He's the least <laughs> loathsome oh, and loathsome. he does do the occasional good deed but his knee-jerk convictions are deeply racist, deeply conventional and deeply, deeply conservative. He absolutely hates Roosevelt because he's enacting the, you know, the five-year plan and he's a socialist um, for his time and he just thinks this is the end of the world. Do you think the author is trying to suggest that this is a period that's gone now? No, I don't think so. I didn't read it as a historical document. I guess that's why, particularly Mrs Bridge. You know, we thought it was the 50s, it was the 30s, but the issues are the same. He's non-judgmental. I guess that's the beauty of it. And maybe it's that uh, strategy of having those kind of humorous titles. Mm -hmm. So, you know, even there's tragedy, comedy in that. He's, you never feel that you're being told what to think. Yeah. Because I'm undecided. And I think, for me, that's what makes it a classic. If we're, if we're putting this in the category of classics, that's what I think, that it still has that amazing, very astute observer's eye that you recognise and admire in terms of his point of view. But it, he's not patronising of his characters. They are who they are and he gives you enough background to understand why they're who they are and why India has she's not equipped to form opinions because all she he says at one point she had her parents opinions mm. and then she overlaid those with Walters and that's what she's got to work with and that's it <laughs> of the two did you think stylistically one was not superior but kind of more courageous I thought Mrs Bridge was I thought that was a daring book for its time, it was very critical of the culture that produced those people without ever saying so. Mr Bridge was a little bit more formulaic. It's more conventional. I've never read anything like Mrs Bridge, that kind of that, that breaking down into these little morsels yes. and, you know, that opportunity to have that kind of undercutting of the titles. That's the brilliance for me. More than, more than anything, I think, the structure of it. Now, we've had the opportunity as women of a certain age to read this book in the company of women half our ages. Our daughters' ages. Our daughters' yeah. ages. And they were all shaken by it. And a couple of them said, oh, God, I'm like Mrs Bridge. Yes. So if anything makes it a classic, that does, I think. Mm. We've just put it to the test. Yes. I agree. A highly recommended pair of books, Mrs Bridge and Mr Bridge. They were reissued in 1990. Evan S. Connell is the author and they were made into a film with Paul Newman and Joanne Woodward in 1991. I was chatting there with Olga Sankey. You're listening to Sundoku, the podcast for people who love talking about books almost as much as they love reading them. I'm Adrian. I'm in my mid-50s which is a lie. As a child uh, of my generation, I was completely entranced with Enid Blyton books and I also had an obsessive compulsion to read all the Biggles books. They transported you into another world, which was always the great joy of reading. I think my favorite book of all time is André Gide's La Symphonie Pastorale. Now, interestingly, it's not a book that gets a great deal of good press. For one thing, André Gide was a very difficult person, probably, and the subject matter is also actually quite challenging, the notion of a country priest forming a relationship uh, with a younger woman. However, I think it's the point in my life when I read it, which was... I was emerging from teenage years into adulthood and somehow or other I found it kind of primal reading it. 
uh, for the complexities of my own psychology or whatever. And actually, I have reread it a number of times, partly to try and tap the mystery of why this book that nobody else seems to like is something that I find compuls- a compulsion to read. Look, I find there's something perilous in my view in putting a book at my bedside in that it's almost a guarantee I won't read it. The book that I've had by my bedside for some time is a new biography of Don Dunstan, which I find is beautifully written and also informative. It tries in a kind of objective way to locate Don's political achievements and the important and interesting aspects of his personal life in a, in a nice analytical context. And remember, we love hearing from random readers, so if you want to tell us about your Sundoku, don't hesitate to get in touch. And that's it for today. Catch you next time. And from me, goodbye till next time. This podcast is produced by four book addicts who are refusing treatment. Annie Hastwell, Kath Keneally, Sarah Martin, and me, Michaela Andreev. Our thanks to composer Quincy Grant for the music. And if you want to know more about the books, the authors, or the music featured in this episode, check out the show notes. You can find us on Facebook and Instagram at SundokuCast. That's T-S-U-N-D-O-K-U-Cast. Cast.